Most investments carry risk, but there's one that is all upside. The only risk-free investment is an investment in yourself. The Globe and Mail is the largest business newsroom in Canada, interpreting and unpacking macroeconomics, housing, policy decisions, and world events. Enjoy a comprehensive suite of business newsletters, breaking news, and market updates straight to your inbox. As a subscriber to the Globe and Mail, you'll get access to investor tools like advanced charting, portfolio with the Wellscope report card, providing an independent six-factor review of your portfolio, and stock screener to help you find the right investments. The Globe and Mail is offering a special digital subscription rate just for Looney Hour listeners. For a limited time, get access for $75 a year for your first year. For more details, visit globeandmail.com slash podcast. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that this information discussed today is not intended to be or construed as investment advice. Please consult a professional advisor before putting a loony in any of these financial markets. The dirty secret is that no one's ever going to get paid back or have the shortest memories when it comes to investment. We just got to get Keith into Bitcoin. Hey, there's a bubble. Welcome back to Looney Hour, episode 74. As always, joined by the three amigos, we got Rich Diaz of Acorn Macro Consulting and Keith Dicker of Ice Cap Asset Management. Keith, the jet setter, where are you now, buddy? I'm in uh, Barcelona. It's funny. We're at the uh, airport in, I think it was Germany on the way over. And it, everything is very monotone in, in Germany. It's like boarding. <laughs> but yeah, they you know, say we're boarding this airline. And all of a sudden they say, hey, we're boarding for Barcelona. There's so much excitement here. If you ever have a chance to come over this area, it's, it's lots of fun. But, you know, Boomer's been working hard, Rich, for like cent- next, oh, 50 plus years. Now Century. I'm ready. Yeah, I know. But I'm having a bit of a holiday here and, and some work as well. Some interesting experiences we'll share with you. But it, it's a beautiful city, guys. It's a beautiful culture. Uh, if you look underneath everything, there's a pile of debt. The currency system is shot and everything and interest rates. It doesn't make sense. But it's beyond that, it, it's good. Yeah, you're, you're having a good time in the fantasy land, eh? <laughs> That's a good way to put it. As they add the red, red wines flowing with well, your, uh, your Pinot guy. Uh, yeah. Wines here are beautiful. The, the, the food is beautiful. It's a really nice lifestyle. And it's, it's quite literally one of the cleanest cities I've ever seen. Like, it's real nice. And it's always sunny here. Kind of like London, right, Rich? Uh, no, London is gray and miserable and it actually snowed last night, which is very, very sad. Um, Cause I was biking home after working pretty late. And so I got caught in the snow. But I was wearing my helmet for change, so that was good. And um, oh, and man. the Pinot is not nearly as good, and uh, the tapas aren't as good. But the beer, I can assure you, is much better. One thing that's really cool about the the Barcelona that city is is the Gaudi Museum. If you ever get a chance to go up there, Keith, there's also a rooftop terrace, which is amazing. It gives you a really wonderful view of the whole city. And then there's also the cathedral, right? That they've been working on for how many years? I think it's like a thousand. I want to say a thousand years they've been, or is it, or is it five hundred or something? It's something absolutely ridiculous. Or did I get that totally wrong? Uh you're you're close. It's like a hundred years they've been going. At <laughs> I was it. totally but wrong. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you know it, it's uh, if you go on the, the the church cathedral tours in, in in Europe, like they're they're beautiful. Hey, like St Paul's Cathedral, London is it's outstanding. Yeah, it's amazing. This one in Barcelona, it's. It's, it's real nice. You should go to, if you have a chance, like yeah, the, the architecture is, is incredible. Keith, you're going to bring back some nice wine or you're not allowed. Uh, he's going to get tariffs. You know. He's going to get, he's going to get, uh, he's going to, the tax man's going to come after him. <laughs> oh. what, you know what young, yeah. So what you young guys don't appreciate is as you get older, you, it's just all about consumption. That's all it is. You don't need to collect stuff anymore. It's just I, consume, I don't know. consume. I brought some wines back from Italy, and let me tell you, that was a mistake. The tariffs were were more than the actual wine itself. I got a I got a surprise bill when I when I finally got the package. Well, speaking of surprise bills, it looks like the Americans want to raise taxes. I'm pretty sure the Canadians might raise taxes. So let's let's jump over to some Boy, nice stuff here. Wow, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's, there's a alcohol tax coming. In being increased in April here, actually, ironically. Oh, enough. good. More regressive taxation. <laughs> Just so we need to tax the poor more than we tax the rich. 
So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, speaking of which, um, you know, we're actually filming this on a Wednesday, just given Keith's travel schedule, but we wanted to sort of at least hold off until we got the announcement from the Bank of Canada. Uh, we did this the first time we haven't done a Twinkie bet. We We were kind of all discussing it offline and figuring, well, you know what, it's probably going to be a non-event. And so it's probably not even worth wasting a good Twinkie on. And uh, sure enough, that was the case. The Bank of Canada held rates. Uh, they did not have a press, press conference, just simply a statement that came out. Uh, essentially, they said, okay, yeah, we're still pausing. The economic data is in line with sort of our expectations based on what we forecast or what we see. We still have inflation getting into the three handle by this summer. Uh, and so, yeah, it was pretty much status quo. Uh, but Keith, I don't know if you had any sort of takeaways uh, from, from the discussion or from the announcement today. Yeah, it's a couple of different ones. Uh, so first of all, you know, my, my critique of the Bank of Canada is that they haven't been consistent. They've been, you know, flipping, flopping all over the place here. And the last meeting, they, they clearly said, we're now pausing. And they set the expectation that, you know, maybe they might hike rates again. But if, if they were to hike rates again today, I, I don't know what would have happened. It would have, you know, the loony hour would have, you know, done loony things, of course. But uh, it was as expected today. But like everything in our global financial world, and, you know, Canadians may not want to hear this, Canadian bank stockholders, it doesn't revolve around Canada. Everything revolves around the Americans. And so you, so you get this great week here where the Canadian Bank of Canada came out with their press with their, with their statement. And uh, it was as expected. It, it's now dovish. They're going to wait it out. And the Americans, meanwhile, are continuing to remain hawkish. And you might hear, but for ice cap, I often refer to this, this path. And it's a path that we expect the economy to go on financial markets to go on and, and you know, monetary policy. And, and, and this path or journey, not Aerosmith Rich, like journey or, or path, it's going now as we expected. And, and the main expectation with this is that the Federal Reserve, they do not want to repeat the monetary policy era that happened in, in the late 70s and early 80s. And what that era was, was that they stopped hiking rates and actually cut rates in response to the recession they created. And it, it, it didn't resolve the inflation problem. And for everyone listening, you're, you're really into this because it, it's a really cool story, but it's irrelevant whether you believe central banks can control inflation. I'm not on, on that page at all, especially the current inflation experience that we have here now around the world. Um, but it's been very clear, and it started at Jackson Hole last summer when you know Powell did the mic drop speech, and he basically said, we're going to be a lot more hawkish than you're expecting. And he had a few things taking place in between. But what's most interesting, now that the uh, the Uber dove has left the uh, Federal Reserve and has moved over over to uh, the White House, um, Le La Lenaire, what what is her name? Leo Braille Leonard. Or yeah. Le Leo Correct. Brainerd. That's it. So she's now out of the picture. <clears throat> so now the Fed is able to do what they want to do. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, they want to hike rates. And that's going to have a huge impact around the world of financial markets, equity markets, credit markets, you, you name it. And uh, here in, in Canada, the likely path, Rich, for the Canadian yep. dollar is which, which direction do you think? Uh, lower? Weaker versus the U.S.? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I would go with as well. So I just think this is a great opportunity for people to, uh, you know, move beyond that, you know, that binary balance fund mandates that people have been using for, for a long time now. Um, you know, if, if you properly add currency exposure to your portfolio, you, you have a great opportunity to reduce your risk and even add some uh, additional return here coming up. But it, it's been a great week. It's been really Keith, good. Keith, I don't think, you know, it seems like to me some of the larger concerns just, you know, around Twitter, YouTube, we got a bunch of emails from listeners and stuff. And, and everybody seems definitely a little bit, you know, the people I think that are listening to the show are concerned about, you know, the Canadian dollar. And I think, I think in general, most of the public maybe doesn't really take, you know, the macro into consideration. Right. So for example, when I think of, you know, the retail investor in Canada, I think of someone that, 
you know, they own their primary residence. That's, that's majority of their net wealth. Um, and then they might have like an investment property in addition to that, you know, also here in Canada. And so all of their wealth is, you know, predominantly tied up in Canadian assets. And so, you know, if you have this situation where house prices, let's say, go flat for a number of years, so nominal, there's no very little growth on a nominal basis. So, you know, on a real adjusted basis for inflation, you know, it's essentially not storing your wealth or not holding value. And then you overlay the, the currency on top of that and say, well, if the Canadian dollar continues to say oh, underperform, you know, the rest of the G7 currencies, it, it turns out to be a, you know, pretty bad investment over, you know, a five or 10 year period. How, how, how should Rich, I mean, how should people be looking at this? Um, Cause I, like I said, we've had a lot of fan mail and stuff like that. That's come through and saying, well, how is this going to work? If the Fed is seriously hell-bent on continuing to push rates, they're the world's most important central bank, and the BOC remains on pause, what does this mean for your average day-to-day Canadian? Well, I mean, wait, do you wait, know wait, the, do you Rich, know this... one second, Rich, one second. Steve, you used the word fan. I don't know if we have any fans, maybe a few stalkers, maybe, <laughs> but let, let's... Let... Uh, we have at least That's one fan. Realistic. My Ke- mom, Ke- Keys, yeah, Keys, mom sent in a couple questions, and <laughs> we, have, we have three fans. Each of our moms. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Very true. Go ahead, Rich. Sorry about that. Um, no, no, it's all right. I mean, it was a very important point that you made. Um, what I was gonna say, you know, Madonna, very famous singer, she had a song called "We're Living in a Material World" or "I'm a Material Girl," whatever. I'm of the view that in finance and in most people's lives, we live in a nominal world. And, I, and not in a real world. And I think that that's, um, you know, people always, when people tell you get they get um, wage hikes, they never tell you what the wage hike is um, adjusted for inflation. And I think it's a similar story when you think about currencies. It's really not so important what people's currencies are in relation to another countries, unless they're a world traveler like, um, like Keith. Um, I think what what matters really is what is their purchasing power within their own country. Um, I think, and I think that's and what's related to purchasing power is obviously inflation. Now, the thing that Canada, so although I think there's overall, I think there's aggregate down pressure from what the Fed's doing versus what the Canadian central bank is doing that's basically in inverted commas that's related to something which someone asked us about which is called interest rate parity and it means that you know if you, if the, the central bank of canada does not follow suit and raise interest rates there's going to be an, the you know the theory says you're going to have downward pressure on the canadian dollar who knows i mean that i mean these these theories are meant to be pushed back on but they just sort of give you a framework for thinking about the currencies i think what's important for canadian dollar is number 1 it won't necessarily go down versus the euro or the yen so your vacation money and your purchasing power this summer will probably be just fine um those currencies will be equally under pressure i mean and i also and i also think it's really important to remember that canada's terms of trade is dominated still by the oil price and I've been on record that the, I think the oil price has basically found its floor here. And whether you look at like three years out the curve or whether you look at supply dynamics or whether you look at demand, what's going on in China, whatever, hate them or love them, they're going to start consuming more and more oil as they open up. And the terms of trade basically is your export, the price of your exports relative to your price of imports. And why is that important? It's because ultimately it will put a floor under some kind of currency level. Now, that's the beauty of being one of the most world's most important oil exports in you know, in a world where that commodity is that commodity is expensive and and or rising your currency gets artificially pushed up by that and so that's why although i think the canadian dollar might fall versus the us dollar i think in general you might have a decent um you might you'll have a decent terms of trade you might offset some of that inflationary impulse um, and actually, funnily enough, what that means is that Canada's currency on a purchasing power parity basis is actually relatively cheap relative to history, believe it or not. And so it's, it, I don't actually think it'll be as bad as I think what people are, are sort of making out to be. Um, that's my long winded answer to get around. But I think it's important to cover all those little pieces. Do you mean Alberta oil might actually save us? <laughs> 
<laughs> if it wasn't for Canadian oil, we'd be totally effed. Uh, let's make that make the very, very clear, whether it's our current account balance, whether it's um, inflows, whether it's a lack of productivity, whether it's, you know, the, I mean, it, it, it funds our welfare state, make no mistake about it. And it's important because we get a huge, huge inflows of US dollar. So e.g. hard currency. So it's the perfect thing to sell to the person with the strongest sort of currency. The problem with Canada is we don't have enough refining capacity and so much of the value of the oil, barrel of oil is in what's known as a crack spread, which is by the way, is still at like a 20 year high, um, although it's come off a bit. So anyways, I could go on and on about the oil. Tell us, piece, tell us more about crack spreads. No, no, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna move on with the crack spreads, but it is really important to note that like, you know, Canada's terms of trade is linked to oil. Um, and although we might lose relative to the US dollar, I would submit to you that we'll probably continue to be okay versus the euro, the yen, and a bunch of other currencies around the world. Keith, do you have any views on that? Do you, I mean, I mean, kind of curious actually your your view on uh, the oil markets right now, or I guess in the near term. Well, first of all, I think Rich just came up with an extremely important point. So, in, in addition to the diffusion index, you know, oh, have no. purchasing power parity. I think that's the pickup line. That could work. <laughs> It's very important. <laughs> you can't ignore it. <laughs> I think I think you might be ignored if, if that's your, uh, your <laughs> new line coming up. <laughs> uh, so 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 right now with you know we had this you know sort of divergence with monetary policy with the Americans and, and the Canadians and it, it it's happening and it could be happening all over the world. And by remind me to come back to Japan here in a few minutes. I think Japan is the market that could really cause capital to flow here. Um, you know, Steve made a, a good point earlier and you did as well, Richard, and indirectly what you guys were suggesting was that if we just get a normal economic cycle here now, like nothing nothing hard or anything, we just sort of ebb, ebb and flow here. And the Canadian dollar is not gonna move too much in, in any direction. It'll be similar to, to, to everyone else. The risk with the Canadian dollar is that either end or both, we get a bit of a hard landing here coming up with both the Canadians as well as the Americans. Because remember the Canadian data got a bit softish there in Q4 and, and the January monthly data was okay, but that'll just get revised away. Oh, by the way, we have the Friday jobs report coming up in yep. Canada. Uh, the and in the US. Estimate, yeah, yeah. So last month, if you recall, the estimate was 15,000 and the actual number was 150,000. So, you know, it's a That's little right. oh. outside, you know. Uh, so for this Friday, the estimate is 10,000. And the, uh, yeah, so we're at 10,000. So, you know, what are we going to get? What will it be, Rich? Oh, this, oh, this, is, oh, this, is, this is this is this week's Twinkie Bet. So at the time of the recording, you'll probably have already heard this prediction or time the time of you guys actually you know getting to tune into this uh but rich take it away i'll give you the first uh first crack at it As, uh, so basically hold on the the bet essentially is whoever is furthest away from the actual number is the loser here okay so furthest away so the estimates are 10 um i think my number is gonna be let's go with 87 for one of my favorite hockey players, 87,000. Okay, Keith. So, uh, so for, for you guys, you, you young guys, you probably don't realize the so richest 87, that's gonna be based on the revised number. You you're, you don't know yet, you, you don't, because you have to make, so my expectation is that the 150,000 from last month, that's gonna get revised down. About twenty. That wasn't grand. the bet, though. You're, that wasn't the bet. Is, uh, We're not talking about revision no, bet right now. No, but to come up with your estimate, you need, okay, everyone, listeners or listener, okay. you need to be aware of these things, guys. It, it's a complicated <laughs> market. Uh, so I, I put the number at thirty-five. Thirty-five. Okay, I'm gonna go because I love the uh, stats can random number generators where it literally comes out ten times greater than estimates almost every month. I'm gonna go minus ten thousand. Oh, interesting. Minus, okay. minus 10, Did you write this down? I'm not writing this down. You guys write this down. No, well, well, someone will timestamp it. We got some good we got some good listeners here. That's gonna break the uh, gold seek function, isn't it? Minus 10. <laughs> yeah, stat scans website's yeah, gonna yeah. blow up. Absolutely. Uh, but but circling this back though, we're coming back to the whole concept of whether we get a recession or not. And so the Bank of Canada right now, 
you know, they've stated that they're expecting, you know, a soft landing for the first three quarters of this year, whether it's zero percent or a little bit close to it. Uh, and then they're expecting we return to uh, you know that two percent inflation target next year. That, that that's what they're trying to achieve. The risk with all this is that the, the economy uh, it, it overshoots or undershoots you know to the downside. We get a recession, and that could be happening at the point in time when the American economy is is still stronger or not as weak as what's happening in Canada. So we we have an opportunity or Canadian dollar to get. You know, you know, elbowed in the corner or whatever you want a hockey analogy you want to use with it here. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just one of those things. And we, remember, like everyone else, there are all the other central banks are sort of in the same mode here right now, uh, except the Japanese. We have to come back. I really want to come back to the Bank of Japan, as, as you can tell. But uh, you know, that's the way we're set up here. So right now, again, the, the announcement this week is it's not huge. For the Canadian dollar to move it aggressively, it, it's what happens next from an economic perspective. That's the big one. Well, I mean, I think we've, you know, weighing in the bank of Canada's decision, I think we also have to talk about what's happening in the housing market. Um, you know, there's a report out in the Global Mail there last week about CIBC reporting in their recent bank earnings that, you know, 20% of their residential mortgage borrowers, 20% of them, aren't even, you know, their monthly payments aren't even covering enough of the interest payment. So essentially what's happening at CIBC and some of these other banks is that, uh, you know, they're negative amortizing. And so they're the, the, basically the outstanding interest that should be getting paid on a monthly basis is actually being tacked on to the balance of the mortgage. Uh, and so much so that 20% of all the loans at CIBC are, are you know, the balances are growing. Um, and that's to me is is basically kicking the can down the road. And I, I think it is, you know, if I'm OSFI, the banking regulator, I, I look at that and say, well, that's that's a financial stability concern. And and whether that is a concern, you know, six months from now or 24 months from now, it's it's an issue. And and obviously when you compare Canada and the US and the BOC versus the Fed, um, to, you know, Rich, you've made this point several times, which is the reality is, is pretty much every mortgage in Canada is a variable mortgage. I mean, yeah, you can lock it in for five years, but that ain't very long. No, no, no. That's the same bullshit as transitory. I mean, <laughs> I mean, five years is not fixed at all versus just so people know that the, 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 in the U.S. is 30 year fixed, although I've been told you can 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 get 10 year products in the U.S. But I mean, that's what's so fascinating about all of this, right? I, you know, the the it's it's all it's in a sense it's circular and it's why it's i really kind of love this job because the fed is going to raise rates because the us's labor market is extremely hot and and jerome powell has made that very very clear the canadian bank of canada is stuck between a rock and a hard place because it cannot raise rates more for the reasons if you cited that there's loads of there's loads of short term or short duration liabilities that are going to come up for renewal reset so it's going to pause as it has on the rate hikes which is going to put downward pressure on the currency and that downward pressure on the currency is going to be an inflationary all things being equal given how much stuff that we import so goods i mean we export lots of oil and and other stuff but we import basically all consumer goods etc cetera, etc cetera. you guys if you follow me on twitter you've known i've showed talked this about a long time and so then that the falling currency is inflationary, which puts more pressure on the Bank of Canada to raise interest rates, but they can't because of all these short term and short duration liabilities that households, which are one of the highest or highest levered households in the world, as well as our government's quite highly levered as well. And so it's just this, it's it's just, I mean, it's I'm laughing because it's it's funny, it's absurd, it's kind of sad all at the same time. Um, and, and it's just it's it's really a difficult position to navigate. Ultimately, the question we have to ask ourselves is, you know, what is the worst of what's the what's the outcome that they will do rather than what we think that they should do, to quote uh, famous Keith Dicker here. Um, and 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 it's really the question is, do you think that they'll think is, is inflation more important than, you know, housing resets? Um, Steve, I ask you, do you think they care more about inflation or protecting <laughs> households? And their interest rate and their interest. I payments. don't know if it's so much households. I think they care more about the big five banks. I mean, those. Okay. Well, then there you go. That's a good, good answer. Yeah, like we said, like we said, if, if 20% of CIBC's portfolio is essentially, I'm not going to call it impaired, but it's, 
it's interesting. Uh, you know, TD's TD's doing the same thing. Um, you know, BMO has a similar product. RBC. It's just that you got all these floating variables. And so it's like, the reality is, is like, you know, you, you can say it's, you know, your house, but in reality, it's the bank's house. I mean, stop paying your mortgage and let me know what happens. So it's the, it's the bank's assets, the bank's collateral. And, and obviously it's interesting because the conversations in like, well, this is, this is unacceptable. You know, we, I thought you could only have 30 year amortizations, but now we've got people that have 35, 40, 45, 50 year amortizations because basically, you know, no, no, no principal is being paid down these loans. And ironically enough is that's actually creating a situation where inventory new listings, otherwise distressed sellers that would be, or should be coming to market are actually not coming to market because they're essentially getting a, a free pass, at least for now. And so it's interesting. So now you don't have like any sort of, the market's not able to clear. The market isn't clearing yeah. right now. Like you have very low sales. You got 25 year lows and new listings and it's hard to get any real price discovery. So I think ultimately I'm just very skeptical or maybe I'm naive. Um, I'm going to say, so let's assume that your premise is right, that the Bank of Canada cares more about protecting its banking system than it does about inflation and regular citizens. That's not unprecedented. The Federal Reserve demonstrated such a preference in 2008, where they cared more about their banking system than random people and certainly people who don't have money. Um, which means that that in, and so what they'll do is basically keep rates lower than they otherwise should, given the inflation profile, given the unemployment profile, given the population growth profile, which means rates will stay lower, which will save the housing market in inverted commas, again, being broad strokes here. And it means that ultimately inflation will will not go down anywhere near as fast as it should be. I'm I don't agree with Keith. I think central banks can affect inflation. Um, I'm not, I'm not as, you know, I'm not as, I'm, I'm not as, I don't know, hardened in my views on that. I think if the central banks raised interest rates to 10%, I'm sure inflation would fall tomorrow. Right. So, so maybe it's a bit more nuances of you, but so I think that if we go with your premise, Steve, which I think is a fair one, given the recent history, I think that just means that people should be, you know, in their minds, I think inflation expectations are not going to fall. And I think that people are going to feel even more squeezed. Um, but again, asset holders will probably be okay. So think about the situation. Okay, let's think about this. You know, it's kind of like European fantasy land. Type. I think it might be more of a reality opportunity. Uh, but for us here in Canada, what what if we experience a, a domestic recession? Things roll off, and the Canadian dollar is coming off as a result of it. And then all of a sudden, inflation is being imported because of the lower Canadian dollar, and you know that. Yeah. We suspect commodity prices can probably remain quite sticky coming up. Now, now, granted, you know we, we have an incredibly dynamic economy, not just in Canada, but the, for the whole world. So you, you get a lot of offsets taking place here. But we could potentially be in a situation where you have a recession happening, which is job losses, which is losses on mortgage portfolios, which is very negative for the banks. And the Canadian dollar is, is, is coming down. And all of a sudden, the Bank of Canada has to react again to raise rates during a declining <laughs> economy. And that's that's the risk here. So that's no central bank wants to have that opportunity. The moment you have to start raising your rates to protect your currency, you know, it, it, it's like Thailand and everything back. So back basically, you're an emerging market. <laughs> Absolutely. And it can happen very quickly. Like it, I know. You can get some pretty rapid as, as soon as... If it's, if, because of the, the, you know, the other narrative with that scenario, and let's put that a 99% opportunity that, that a probability it will happen. Rich, 99%. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it's not high. <laughs> uh, like if everyone listening here, it just shows that sometimes we don't even listen to each other when the other one is, is speaking. However, I just didn't understand the joke. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 100% means it's guaranteed to happen. Yeah. 99% yeah. means it's, it might happen, right? There's a good right. opportunity for it. Yeah. Fair enough. But yeah, yeah. But fair enough. But, but if, if you do have that happening at, at the same time, um, you know, <laughs> again, it's just going to create that this ultimate stressful moment for everyone in, in the economy, you know, in, including realtors out West. Now, I'm sure it's not oh, something no. Steve, Oh, oh dear. 
Pizzolatto is impenetrable. I know. When they built the Ark, they put a realtor on board? I, I don't remember. Was, was that one of the important ones to add? Someone, to someone had to sell the tickets. <laughs> you know, we're talking about, you know, some pretty aggressive moves that could come up here. But uh, that's I mean, is this your base case? That's not, so is that your base case, Keith? Sorry to interrupt you, but is that your base case? No, the, the, the base case is I, I do not expect, remember, nothing is 0% or 100, right? And it, when you're talking about economic outcomes, but we suspect it, it's hardly unlikely Canada will have an isolated economic event. Right. If Canadians are experiencing stress, you know, so are the Brits and the Aussies and, you know, everyone else. Um, because again, like, you know, I'll, 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 I use this expression a lot as well, that risk has been synchronized around the world. And when, and we're still in that moment, we're looking for some kind of a trigger point that might offset it. But the point is you could next move into this world where central banks are no longer raising rates to try to offset inflation. Instead, they're raising rates for some other reason, you know, and, and again, it may not make sense what, what's going on here. These, these are nervous. These are nervous lads. Speaking of, but the problem, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, yeah, you had the Fed, uh, Jay Powell was uh, testifying in, in, in Congress uh, the other day. So um, Powell basically said, he said the words, quote, disinflation just one time in his prepared remarks for Congress. Uh, the one mention of disinflation was, Quote, there is little sign of disinflation in the category of core services. Um, so it seems like disinflation is, in fact, new uh, transitory. Can I, take my di- can I take my victory lap? Should I take my bow here for two years of telling people that inflation is not freaking transitory and it's not going away? And uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, I think what's really, it was a really super hawkish speech. So and let's give Keith his flowers too. I think Keith's been consistent from the beginning of summer. He's telling everybody exactly what they do. And I thought it was worth reminding everyone of one of my favorite quotes of all time from a central bank. It's not quite a quote, but I think it's from, it's it's I think it's apropos right now, which is economic expansions don't die of old age. They get murdered. And that's Ben Ben Bernanke quote. And I think Powell is out for blood. I think he's he's sharpening his knives, and I think he's very very clear on what needs for what he needs to see before they stop basically raising interest rates. I mean, and he said it as much, which is a softening in the labor market. Um, and that's, of course, what ticked off all of the Democrat Senate committee members. And I think he equally upset all the, the Republicans committee members. But I think that that's that was a, for me the takeaway rather rather. Sorry to say, uh, Steve, rather than the inflation, uh, the disinflation bit was that he needed to see a softening in the labor market. Yeah. And it goes back to remember the composition of the Fed has now changed. So they, right. they have a great. Yeah, they can stay hawkish here. And. Yeah. Anyway, that's why it's, this, it's, this Friday, this Friday's that. number is so important, but that's why this Friday's number is so important. Again, every, so uh, the first, usually it's the first Friday of every month, but because of February has 28 days, as some of us are aware, um, the, the non-farm payrolls is coming out, I think on Friday. And that's why, I mean, it's just going to be amazing to watch. I recommend everybody sitting in front of their computer and just watch what happens when that number gets released. Cause if that number is a good number, a really solid number, three, 400, we saw the ADP number come out today more than expected. If that number is like three or four hundred thousand, I mean, I would the doll, the Canadian dollar is going to sell off, right, Keith? I mean, uh, something's going to happen. I tell you, I don't know how you want to remain dateless until Friday. Like this is solid gold stuff here. Oh, my so God! So <laughs> did you guys did you guys see uh, in the in the Congress there, uh, Elizabeth Warren? I mean. It's politics, granted, but she was she was basically going off about, uh, you know, how the Fed was, you know, obviously trying to target to, to push the unemployment rate higher, given it's, what is that, 50, 60 year lows or something right now. And so basically she's like, what do you mean, you know, two million Americans are going to lose their jobs? And it's like, I mean, this is kind of the sacrificial lamb that uh, that central bankers need. They need some slack in the labor market. It's literally their mandate for the record. <laughs> it's like their mandate is twofold. Uh, it's full employment, whatever the hell that means, and inflation close to or below two percent. I think it's right, but it's just interesting the given word. the it's just interesting given like the, the, the you know the politics involved, right? Oh yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, I mean but that, this is all political theater. Um yeah, exactly. You know, financial markets don't move on Elizabeth Warren. Thank God. 
Don't but I know like, like yeah. I know that um you know Volker back in the 80s and Arthur Burns before him, right? Like there wasn't the political willpower to 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 actually fight inflation by meaningfully raising rates. And that's why they, they chickened out the first time and you had that second wave of of inflation. Right? Because nobody No, but it is political theater because I mean, you know, what what Nixon did was super inflationary, right? And and even though he was a Republican. Um, what all, so many of his moves were inflationary, and that's why it's someone as you know, as you know, I'm not sure as gifted is the right word, but as, as stubborn as Paul Volcker was, was able to sort of, you know, um, to push back. And I think Powell sees himself. You know, someone wrote this to me in an email months and months ago, and I'll give credit. I can't remember his name. I think his name is Alex, real estate guy from Toronto, but he was the one who actually put that in my head. You know, I think. Jerome Powell sees himself as, as a Paul Volcker of the, this day, maybe to a lesser degree, shorter, and he's a lawyer, not an economist, fine. But um, I think I think he sees himself in that. And I think in a weird way, the more the economy continues, the, lab- the stronger the labor market is, the more cover he has to do what is quote unquote right with respect to monetary policy. Um, so like I said, Friday is going to be an interesting day. I mean, it's interesting just following like the Canadian politics here. I mean, it seems to me like the you know the deficit spending, the the handouts, the checks in the mail are still flowing through. Oh, I don't know. I oh, mean, yeah. it depends how you define it, right? Because if you, if you look at it, define it like strictly unemployment insurance, that number has, has gone down to normal. But I don't think the deficit's going to come in anytime soon. Certainly I, not in the U.S. and certainly I, not in Canada. I mean, I'm here in B.C. The B.C. government's uh, expected around a four point two billion dollar deficit this year. Uh, you know, they were just out uh, a couple of weeks ago. Basically, they're subsidizing the BC ferries now because they don't want the, the BC ferries says, listen, guys, we got to jack up our, our rates. We got to jack up the cost of tickets um, because, you know, operating expenses are up, wages are up. And and the BC government saying, no, no, we'll subsidize that. So that way, you know, prices don't have to go up. And it's like, it's just it, it's interesting, right? And so they've got a four point two billion dollars uh, uh, deficit that they're expected to run, and I think I could be wrong on this, but I I, I know like a huge, huge, huge chunk of their revenues are actually from property transfer taxes in this in Yikes. this province, and you've got I you've got you know property sales running at or around ten year lows. Guys, we're we're living. This- economic monetary dream you know that this is what it is right now and like for example uh, in in france the last couple of days there's, there's been some serious national protests because they want Can you to, tell us why uh, yeah they're, yeah <laughs> they're uh, they want to raise the uh official retirement age from 62 to 64 i think that's what it is <laughs> And, um, you know, it, again, it's, you know, it, by doing that from an actuarial perspective, like it, it, it shaves billions of dollars off liabilities and, and stuff like that. But, you know, everyone here, we're all, again, risk is synchronized. It, it, it literally is. And it's just going to take some kind of a trigger point. And you know where it could come from, Steve, Rich? Out, outside Europe. Canada? Economic <laughs> fantasy yeah, land. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, we haven't talked about the Japanese, which which I've mentioned a few times now. Wait, it's, wait, 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 Steve. I, I keep whoa, interrupting whoa, whoa, you. Whoa. You're nowhere near hard enough on the French. The reason life ex- life people were able to retire at 62 because life expectancy was 62 when those policies officially were introduced. Now life expectancy is like 85, and they haven't changed it in 30 years, and they want to raise the the retirement age by two. This is going to draw the ire of my mom. She's not going to be happy that I'm telling her that she needs to work a couple years longer but man it is outrageous that people are bitching about the fact that they need to raise um retirement ages all right sorry keith go this ahead. is probably Please completely a completely uh irrelevant to the conversation but i don't know the, the idea of retiring for like 20 25 years I, I don't know that seems like a really long time what do you do with your life if you don't live in the Cote d'Azur and drink beautiful cheap wine and uh, perfect weather, you live in, in Kitsilano. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jeez. I mean, I guess if you're like Keith Jet setting around the world first class, it might be pretty fun. <laughs> anyway, Life Keith, tell us about Japan. <laughs> Life is beautiful. Um, so the potential trigger point here coming up, uh, so there's now a new head of the, of the BOJ, the Bank of Japan. I, I don't remember his name at this point. Which, which is I, I should I forgot you know, already. Rapidly sorry. come up with come up with his name. Uh, so the, the risk we have here now is 
that the BOJ, that they do turn a, a little bit hawkish. And that's all it takes, just a little bit hawkish. And if, if, if that happens, all of a sudden it could become the, the trigger point for an extraordinary extraordinary amount of uh, Japanese foreign investment, literally cash that's overseas to be domesticated. So you, you bring it back home. So that's extremely positive for the uh, Japanese yen, of course, if, if that happens. But not only is it taking money out of foreign markets, so Canada, the US, Europe, and, and everywhere else, uh, it weakens banks because that money's on deposit. Maybe it, it's held up in more fixed investment and then maybe they, Steve, maybe you can uh, do a real estate deal you're selling for someone as opposed to on, on the buy side. But th again, if, if this would happen, it, it could trigger this event where all this capital is just all of a sudden gushing back into Japan, which is at the very moment in time where everyone's economy is sort of, hey, are we going to go into recession or, or not? And I know I talk about America all the time. It's, it's incredibly important, but so is the Japanese because they, they've been on this, I'm going to suggest 25 plus year period where they've been incredibly dovish. And all of a sudden th this could change very quickly. It'll be the smallest change, like it, just a hint that they want to become hawkish. So you have, you have to watch that. I mean, what you're basically selling is that bonds are still overvalued globally. You think interest rates should be much, much higher, just the whole yield curve? Because, I mean, the 10-year bond yields below four, right? And so you're saying that that's just not the right number? I mean, that the, the, that the yield curve should not be inverted, that bond yields should be five and six or whatever? I mean, is that what, what you're ultimately saying, Keith? Um, and that's sort of a different conversation with it. Um, okay. But if, if we go into that environment, credit spreads should blow out. Remember, like right, right now, credit spreads are not suggesting. The yield no. curve is suggesting, you know, especially like you look yeah. at the inversion in, in the in the treasury market right now. Like it, right now, it's at the, uh, the, the widest point it's been in, in years, simply because all of a sudden people are now pricing the Fed at going up to 5.5% maybe, right? So it caused the short end of the curve to go higher. And the 10 years is still at that four level. Three nine and yeah, it's just like under four. Yeah, yeah, but, but again, like again, we're just suggesting that something could happen here, and it doesn't mean from the investment perspective that because something could happen, it doesn't mean it has to happen. But you have to be aware of it because there's nothing worse than a risk event happening with your investment portfolio, and the response is, well, nobody saw it coming. You just have to be aware of everything that that's taking place. It's like if you're playing American football and you're the quarterback. There's a lot of different potential outcomes coming at you. You have your 10 guys in front of you, 11 on their side. That's why the defense is always, you know, plus one on every single play that you could potentially do. It's, you know, there's a lot of things happening. And, and the faster you can process this and appreciate it, you may not like the outcome, but at least then you're, you're not going to be surprised by it. And, and there are ways to position for these fat tail events. If they take place, it's okay, it happened. We were ready for it, right? It, it, it's not one of these, uh, you know, death death stories coming up. Where's the, where's the big fake out? You know, potentially coming from is it is it China? You know, obviously reopening, they're stimulating. Um, is that is that sort of you know the wrinkle, so to speak, especially for central banks, right? You know, trying to tame down demand, trying to clamp down inflation. If you got the second largest economy, out first there, largest. Largest on a purchasing power parity basis. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> oh, people are going to like that. Purchasing it's power true. parity, non farm payroll, diffusion index, crack spreads. <laughs> yeah. Keep going, yeah. Steve. This is a good question. No, I mean, yeah. is that is that is that sort of the? I I think actually, you know, the Bank of Canada actually ironically brought up mentioned China in their statement uh, on they did. for their pause. Right? It's like there's still was some wild the, cards. Was out. it the Bank of Canada or the Liberal government who mentioned China this week? <laughs> that was a zinger. <laughs> <laughs> but the Goldilocks experience right now, moment that's coming up, and you know, we we all hope that's that's what we have here is that inflation in America comes down. The economy wobbles a little bit it, and it, it, it resets. I mean, that, that's the dream scenario we're looking for. And that's what the Fed wants. Everybody else wants it as well. And, you know, that's what we see, which path we take. Keith, you can't always get what you want. You can't always get you what you want, Keith. Sometimes you get what you need. <laughs> 
<laughs> also, that view, that view on China is an unacceptable view. I would just make it very clear that we're going to get before Bill before the weekend's out. Bill 16 is going to come in and wrap us over the head, and we're not going to be allowed to talk about China. In the yeah, Liberal what Party. is the bill? No, I think it's Bill C. 11, sorry. Something like is that, that what it is? The censorship bill? Know. Yeah, it's not great. It's actually probably good for Canadian content creators, just for the record, by the way. <laughs> nah, but anyway, I don't I don't I, think we're creating any content. So we, we're ready okay. to go here. Well, that's good. Um, but the, the other, I mean, the thing about the China thing is really important. I think what people, I think the reason the markets are so like, you know, so seem to be quite ambivalent. I mean, the VIX is still low. I mean, spreads are still with, I mean, the CDS in Italy is down. The, the, Italian, the Euro area stress indicators are okay. Volatility measures are all, I mean, 19 and 18 for V stacks and uh, V VDO, stocks and V DAX and all that VIX volatility indices. Global implied market volatility is all down. I think it's it's weird to me, Keith, and I've been waiting to ask you this question, which is like, why do you think the market's so, you know, to quote the YouTube comments, sanguine <laughs> on the potential for all kinds of different things that go wrong, whether it's spreads, whether it's um, the US, whether it's um, Japan. Um, well, I mean, the market seems just very, very calm and not it seems to be digesting all of these risks really, really well. Um, and I'm not sure why. And I was wondering if you had a view on that. Yeah, because, you know, we, we just got from a moment where that that soft landing was it was priced in or the no landing, for example, which is that's your view. Of- Keith, Keith's big on the no <laughs> landing. He's a no yeah. landing guy. He's called the bottom. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, but that's the view. And, you know, until the data softens and, you know, it, again, I think we're getting closer and closer to that happening. And we, we still live in a cycle. You know, that's what it's going to be. And. That's what's coming. So it's not like we're coming out of something bad. You think about it. Perspective is, hey, things are really bad. We're starting to come out. We're seeing, you know, the green shoots, you know, that Bernanke talked green about. Shoots. Yeah, oh, I remember. There's green shoots. And I remember looking around like, acid I don't see anything. But there was. Yeah, got a 2012 like, acid flashback. <laughs> but now we um, have the opposite. We just come off a, a, an extraordinary period of stimulus remember that's what it was it was driven by stimulus and it's it's not right or wrong it's it's what it was you know all the stimulus is being withdrawn you know slowly 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 and the belief that we can go from probably the most stimulating economic monetary period that earth has ever seen and have us to do the opposite and have a soft landing that can only happen in europe guys that's it that's it what about, um, did you guys see one of the things I wanted to sort of bring up and flag here was there was a good, uh, there was a good tweet thread the other day from, uh, I don't know how to say his last name, Eric Buzz, Buzzmanji or whatever. Keith, you, or Rich, you probably follow him. Maybe. Go ahead. That's a lot of good economic research, but he says, you know, one of the things to sort of keep an eye on is uh, employment in the residential uh, sort of construction space because he says that tends to be highly volatile. And typically speaking, it usually starts to roll over six months after. On average, it's six months after building permits peak. You'll see residential uh, employment will uh, will start to roll off. And so as of right now, it hasn't happened. It's been over, I think, residential permits peaked over six months ago. So he's saying just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean it won't happen. Uh, and he essentially argues that you could have set, you know, you should expect a couple million jobs in that sec- segment, in that industry, uh, this is for the U.S., of course, but I think Canada, you could probably put that on steroids, um, given how much you know highly levered we are to residential investment in this country. So, funnily enough, Canadian construction employment has actually gone up. <laughs> but this is I'll the random that, num- I mean, lot, number I, generator. I, no, I just... no, 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 no. The month on month, I'll concede to you that who I mean, I monthly changes, I'll concede to you that it's a random number generator. We're going to we bet a Twinkie on it. Who knows who will actually eat the Twinkie when it comes to like these longer term charts that start in 1976 um, that get revised regularly. I mean, Canadian construction is now 8% of employment of total employment is at 1.6 million jobs I'm looking at the chart. I mean, I I don't agree that they're this is just BS and they've made up these numbers. Sorry, Steve, I, I can't. No, I mean I I'm not saying that. I think when you actually have enough of a time frame to actually go back, revise, right. smooth it out, it will tell you kind of what what is what. But in terms of like real time right. leading indicators, 
I mean, it's tough to use the labor market as a leading indicator for every anything. Remember, labor markets are lagging indicators. So I just that's important for everybody to know. So um, you would look I do at agree. Building permits. Sorry, go ahead. You would look. Yeah, at I think building, building permits are a good one. I think what's what's also you know people have talked about this phenomenon before and has been dismissed offhand. It's a bit kind of rose tinted glasses, but the idea of hoarding labor is a really fascinating one. And in a world where there's severe labor market shortages, where you have these democratic, democratic, excuse me, demographic phenomenon that we haven't seen in 60, 70 years, where they're just not enough warm bodies, you know, you are, you might be in a position where companies will take profit margins, hits on their profit margins, excuse me, in order to maintain and keep labor that will be much more scarce in the future. And so that's called labor market hoarding or employment hoarding, where you, you in a normal cycle, you might fire somebody, but because of the severe labor market shortage and because it's such a pain in the butt to get a bricklayer, a construction worker, a welder or whatever, you'll either put him on lower hours or you'll just, you just won't get rid of him. And that, and I've, you've seen the comments in the ISM to that effect. There's people who've written articles in the past. People have been ridiculed by that because you say, well, companies are profit-making businesses and they don't give a crap about keeping employees or not. And I think it's a purely self-interested motivation from those companies that will keep those people hoarded or on, on the bench, so to speak, rather than get rid of them. Who knows? Again, that's a quite a positive view on, on some a negative cycle. Um but anyway, that's, I think that's a really interesting one. We'll definitely keep an eye on that going forward. We've had a lot of comments from like the, uh, the viewers and listeners. Cause they say, Oh, you know, you're always talking about like the tightness in the labor market and da, 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 And, uh, you know, you guys never bring up, you know, technology and AI, which is going to solve for, you know, at least some or a lot of these issues, which I think is a pretty valid point. I mean, you don't, you know, obviously this, uh, more of a macro show. It's a discussion, but I think it's certainly a discussion that's worth having. I mean, there's no question that I think technology is going to continue to evolve at a rapid pace. And um, that, that could certainly solve a lot of our, hopefully our productivity, productivity issues uh, as well as labor constraint. Yeah. I mean, the, the idea that the AI will destroy countless jobs to me is, is, is a tale as old as time. It, re it reminds me of, What's I think it's an insult. Someone you call somebody a luddite. It's when uh, you think that technology is going to destroy jobs, and it's from the 1800s, I think, in England, when there was basically they invented the tractor, and all these yeah. farmers and these peasants were pissed off because they thought they were going to lose their jobs. And yes, they may have lost some of their jobs. What it was is that labor just got transferred to a different part of the economy, and everybody's productivity or GDP per capita went up. I'm not 100%. suggesting that the eight late. I'm not just suggesting that England 1800s is the ideal situation for a laborer. But my point is, since that, I think that's where that terminology comes from. And you call somebody a luddite, so that's why the the pushback against technology, suggesting that technology kills jobs, is basically as old as time. And I just, I it does not stand to any kind of test of logic or reason or history. Okay. So, yeah. well, we'll keep hearing it. AI is going to kill jobs. AI is. I think it's people. Of yeah, but people demonize technology because they don't. I mean, most people don't like change. Keith. Yeah, ask Paul Krugman. He ask ask Paul Krugman's view on the internet in 1994. <laughs> that guy sucks. Was it him? Was it him? Yeah, it was. It was, it was Paul Krugman. Yeah. He said it was like he was I like remember, it's gonna be like it's gonna be like the fax machine. You know, I had a similar experience way back. Uh, I started working. Uh, it's back in the 90s, and uh, uh, this gentleman I was working with at, at the bank up here in Canada. You know, the internet was just starting out basically. And I said to him, hey, can I, can we get access? Can I get access to this? And he said to me, Keith, he said, I've seen it once and I don't like it. We're not going to get this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Completely missed on it. So, uh, but anyways, that's, that's amazing. So what you're saying is the internet's a fad and we should just move on. <laughs> well, what's interesting, I do remember back in like the late nineties, you know, in early O's. So like the two biggest manufacturers of mobile phones, do you remember who they were? Blackberry? Uh, Siemens? Nokia, Nokia. The... Yeah, Nokia and Blackberry. Like those guys had the market. And I'm sure somewhere out there, like in, in, in the bowels of the IT world, you know, their, their systems are still operating, but right, they're, they're gone, right? So, you know, it, it's a great point we're making here. Technology is, it's amazing. It's, 
change this life force all over the place. But you know one thing it's not going to do? It's not going to replace the realtors in Kitsilano, I'll tell you that for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I know. There's lots of things that just can't replace. But uh, here we go, guys. This is a good week. I do have to push off, though. I got some, I have an important Very He's, uh, important he's got some drinking to, drink. to do. <laughs> yeah, he's got some drinking got to some... do. Well, uh, we'll, we'll leave it there. Uh, Keith, thanks for being a trooper for, uh, taking some time out of your family vacation to, uh, deliver the goods, um, to our listeners. Uh, thank you for, for your ongoing support. All we ask is that you share this episode with at least one friend or family member. And as always, we'll see you next week.